Steve, string theory has purported to be a theory that can develop into a final theory with the single one rigid solution. But um, apparently that hasn't, uh, that initial promise hasn't panned out. Yes, I, uh, there was a time in the development of string theory when it seemed that it was going to be the unified theory of uh, every force we know, gravity and all the other forces. It was the, and it still is, the only known theoretical framework in which gravity can be described by the methods of quantum mechanics that we use for describing everything else in nature. And that, of course, was always the largest part of its charm. Uh, and then it was, it was realized that uh, the various types of string theory, the five or six different types of string theory that were known were really only different aspects of a single underlying theory, which is still not well formulated. Uh, that was also tremendously encouraging. And at various times, it seemed like great things were just around the corner. Uh, but I have to say that although I'm st I still feel it's our best hope for the future, that that hope is getting a little thinner, that um, it has not yet gelled. In, for one thing, we don't have a decent mathematical formulation of the theory of which the various versions of string theory, the five or six uh, that we knew about earlier, are approximations. Uh, string theory right now is a series of, uh, it's a collection of approximate theories, which are approximations to a theory we don't know. Uh, so that's one problem. Another problem is the discovery of a vast number of solutions of these theories. I've heard the number 10 to the 500. Yes, that's a one with actually, let's say, between 10 to the 100 and 10 to the 500 uh, solutions, but it's it's clearly a, a vast number. Uh, this, uh, although there were progenitors, the, this really became fixed on people's minds with the work of Busso and Polchinski in the year 2000. Uh, and then Douglas and his collaborators were able to quantify this and say, well, it's a number like 10 to the 500. Um, it's, it's a number vastly larger than the number of particles in the universe, in the observable universe. It's a number which makes any attempt to uh, go through them one by one <laughs> ridiculous. There would not be time in the history of the universe if every intelligent being in the universe worked on nothing else. If every particle were an intelligent yeah, being. That's right. <laughs> it, it's just out of the question. Uh, now, it may be that there is some selection principle which picks out out of that 10 to the 500, only a handful that can be then explored. But uh, in increasingly to the experts in this field, it, it appears that uh, they're all possible solutions and that uh, they all correspond to possible worlds, possible, quote, universes. Mm. Uh, and that... Uh, we cannot therefore hope for what we had hoped for so fervently, a simple theoretical calculation of all the basic constants of nature that we know about in the existing standard model of elementary particles. This is a little bit like what happened with regard to the solar system. At one time, uh, Johannes Kepler thought it would be possible to calculate the the relative sizes of the orbits of the different planets from first principles. He had an elaborate geometric construction where the Mercury revolved on a sphere and around that sphere you had a certain polyhedron and then in, that polyhedron was inscribed in the sphere that Venus <laughs> revolved in and you could calculate the ratio of the size of the orbits of Mercury and Venus, and then do that for all the other planets. That was his final theory. That was his final, well, yeah, was, <laughs> fortunately for him, it was, he was a young man, so he went on to better theories. Uh, 
And then when Newton's work came along, we realized, no, you know, the planetary orbits are just environmental accidents. They're just what they are because that's the way the solar system will form. We'll never be able to calculate with any precision how far the Earth is from the sun on first principles. It's just something we have to give up. Uh, unfortunately, of course, Newton's theory was able to make predictions of, of, of great precision and, and turned out to be quite accurate. Uh, which validated the theory. So we may have to give up uh, the idea of calculating some of the things we had hoped to calculate and just regard them as environmental parameters, things that are that way because we happen to be in that part <laughs> of the string landscape, uh, and instead validate the theory in other ways. You've uh, talked about a final theory using a metaphor as the mind of God. A phrase which is uh, liable to misinterpretation. No, I didn't. <laughs> uh, that was, I think, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, I'm not sure, but it, I don't use that metaphor. <laughs> I, um, I, I think that there is a tendency, uh, and Einstein was particularly um, culpable in this, to use the word God metaphorically in such a way as to... Um, give the impression of a happy reconciliation between science and religion. And I don't buy that. I think there are deep and profound tensions between science and religion. And I would rather not use the word God in any way that suggests uh, any kind of grand unification Einstein had of that sort. Einstein had another phrase that said that one of his questions was, did God, however he used the term, have a choice in creating the universe as he did? What did he mean by that, and how would you reflect on it? I, I got Einstein, in, in a letter to a friend of his, Soloine, explained that when he used the word God, he meant uh, the principle of order and, and harmony in nature. He didn't mean a personal God who concerned himself with human beings. So if you take what Einstein said and um, inter replace the word God by whatever fundamental principle governs the universe, uh, then you could understand what he's saying. Uh, he's saying, is there any uh, freedom in the laws of nature that govern the universe. Are, is only one set of laws of nature possible or are there other possibilities? Well, it's clear there are many possibilities. The laws of nature could be extremely meager. You might have a universe consisting of just a single particle, nothing ever happens, or two particles endlessly in orbit <laughs> around each other according to Newtonian laws, but nothing else in the universe. Uh, so we know that there are choices. The universe could have been very dull. Uh, the, uh, the only way in which Einstein, uh, it seems to me, might have made some sense in, in asking that question, and it, it's the sense in which I would ask it. I mean, it, it, this is really what I think of in our search for a final theory is, uh, are there any other possible rich universes, universes that are not these impoverished counterexamples, like just two particles endlessly in orbit, uh, which are mathematically consistent, which cannot be ruled out on purely logical or mathematical grounds? Uh, is there any choice of a universe complicated enough to include us or to look vaguely like our universe. And that should be a question ultimately answered by this final theory yes. one way or the other. Yeah, and uh, string theory had seemed to provide a candidate for a theory which would be the unique theory. And unfortunately, although the theory itself may be unique, uh, the solutions of the theory are so vast and multiple in nature that the kinds of worlds it describe uh, are without end. And uh, that's what seems to be the case now. But it may not be true. It may be that there is some, because we don't really know what string theory is yet. Uh, uh, string theory is a set of approximations to a theory that we don't yet have. And um, 
one of the things we're missing is the deep principle which string theory is the manifestation of. You could say uh, the Einstein's general theory of relativity can be entirely deduced mathematically as a consequence of a physical principle that Einstein called the principle of the equivalence of gravity and inertia. It's the principle that says that at any point in the gravitational field, you can always find a frame of reference uh, in which the gravity, the effects of gravity are absent, at least in a small region. For example, here on Earth, if you get into a falling elevator, which falls toward the Earth at 32 feet per second every second, then you cannot feel the effects of gravity. This principle is enough, uh, together with uh, Einstein's earlier special theory of relativity, to deduce the whole general theory of relativity. We don't have such a an Ur principle, an underlying mm -hmm. principle for string theory. String theory is a is a mathematics. It's not yet a physical theory because it doesn't have a physical mm -hmm. grounding. You could say, well, string theory, the grounding is the unification of gravity with the other forces. But gravity and the other forces appear in string theory as only on an approximate level. It's only when you study nature at relatively large scales, the scales that are studied in ordinary elementary particle physics, uh, not the scales that were relevant at the very beginning of the universe, uh, that gravity begins to be separate from the other forces. Uh, string theory can't be based on a statement about gravity. That would be basing a theory on statements about an approximation to the theory. That would be <laughs> make no sense at all. Uh, string theory, whatever principle it's based on, we don't know. And uh, some people, uh, probably a growing number of people, are beginning to wonder whether the whole direction isn't a wrong direction. And um, unfortunately, we just don't know any other direction right now. So, uh, you know, it's like that old story about the gambler who uh sitting down to a poker game and he's warned uh, don't you know this poker game is crooked they're going to take all your money he says yes but what can i do it's the only game in town <laughs>